morning, and we will be beginning with the uh, lighting of the first two candles of the Advent wreath, and we're calling Alice by S. Before you may be seated. And so, if you have the uh, song sheet, uh, we will be beginning with the, uh, the prayers at the beginning. Then we'll ask uh, Alice to light the candles and then to say the prayer. And we're inviting Alice forward because we're calling upon people uh, who are active in the community beyond the holy name of Jesus. And Alice is part of the Franklin Regional Council. Uh, Franklin Regional Council of Governments Cooperative Health District, and so it's emergency preparedness, uh, flu shots. Uh, she uh, she's giving me my flu shots with a needle about yay big all the time. Um, and also uh, we have all of our acolytes up here today because uh, today we'll be giving the uh, ten year acolyte cross to uh, Amanda Calvo, and so all of her other compadres up here are showing up at the altar, which is very nice. And uh, that was our little technical difficulty with all that talking. We actually forgot to light the candles. Uh, but now I think we're finally all set. So if you have the song sheet, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Drop down dew from heaven, and let the clouds rain down the just one. You remove the wall which sin had raised between God and us. Through you we have regained access to God. You have reconciled us with the heavenly Father. Our own hearts too, O Lord, are often dark and sinful. Can you imagine that with a, a big needle in your hand? <laughs> prophecy candle urges us to listen, the message of the Bethlehem candle is prepare. Open your eyes. Be aware of what is really going on around you. The Lord is coming. Just as surely as Jesus once came to the town of Bethlehem, so surely he is coming to us. Thank you very much, Alice Majewski. And for my daughter, 
I get to put on a 10 year cross. Okay. All right. I just want to mention. Uh, the last week when we brought up our three new acolytes, or at the very edge of the, uh, the altar up there, uh, they were our 50th acolytes uh, that I brought up to the altar since I got here. So 50 acolytes have come and gone. Uh, some have come for a very short while, not lasted too long. Uh, but six, well now seven, have made it to the 10-year point. Uh, Carolyn Warger, Patricia Warger, Tiffany Warger, Robert Stahelski, uh, my other daughter, Kristen Calvo, and Emily Sanderson um, have all received before Amanda their 10-year cross, and Amanda is now our seventh one who has served at the altar for 10 faithful years. So to all of them, to Amanda, and everybody who serves up here, I really do appreciate their service. Thank you. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will go unto the altar of God. God. Our help in the name of the Lord. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, let us confess our sins to God and prepare ourselves that may worthily participate in this holy sacrifice. The symbolism of the Advent wreath is that light is increasing. We are getting ever closer to the source of all light in our world, Jesus Christ, and his birth at Christmas. Uh, we are still in purple, but today is also an extremely important feast day uh, anticipation. Uh, actually, December 8th is the feast of divine love in our church, uh, but because Sundays always take precedence, that celebration is postponed until tomorrow. But I would still like to talk about that because I know there won't be a lot of people here tomorrow, sadly. Uh, but it's really an important feast day, and I'll be talking about that in the sermon. Uh, but the whole point of the feast of divine love is that creation is a sign of God's blessing. That God is everywhere. He's most especially in our souls, here in the church, in the sacraments. But God is everywhere. Uh, the whole gift of life is, is a sign of divine love. And sometimes the church, sadly, is one of the places that you don't hear that. We talk about so much sin in the world. We talk about a fallen creation. Uh, but our church has always seen creation as a sign of divine love. Uh, sin comes into the world because of free choice, that we don't make the best choices all the time. But God has given us a chance. Uh, with the beauty of this creation, the order of creation, the majesty of creation, uh, to become godlike. And so I'd like to talk about that today on our second Sunday of Advent. So as we prepare today for the celebration of Mass, a Mass that you ask me to please make a private examination of your conscience.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. shout came out from the stock of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be the fear of the Lord. He shall not be judged by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with a rod from his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his way, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not be hurt or destroyed on all of my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to his people. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Here ends the, um, here ends the lesson prescribed by the church for this morning's holy mass. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous shoot to David. As king, he shall reign and govern wise. He shall do what is just and right in the land. And these days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall follow his purity. This is the same day. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord and not into the hands of men. For equal to his majesty is the mercy that he shows. Alleluia, alleluia. Almighty and eternal God, cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. Cleanse my heart and my lips through your gracious mercy, that I may worthy proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips that I may worthy proclaim this holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with A reading from the holy gospel according to St. Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, and make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At the time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him, and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, as they acknowledged their sinfulness. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these very stones. Even now the axe lies in the root of the tree. 
Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit, he will cut it down and will be thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not even worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. By the words of this holy gospel, may our sins be forgiven. Praise be to thee, O Christ. life 
by a series of increasingly rare chemical accidents may make life on a habitable planet a one in a trillion trillion chance. You know, for as much as scientists know, as much as they can manipulate so many things, no scientist has ever been able to create life. They play with all kinds of chemicals, they play with all kinds of energy, they do all kinds of things, but they cannot create life. And so this Paul Davis says that it's a one in a trillion, trillion chance that everything fell into place in a place where it could be habitable, like here on Earth, a one in a trillion, trillion chance. Your odds, my odds of winning the Mega Millions Lottery on Tuesday for what, 300 and some odd million dollars, they are one in 260 million dollars. I'm sorry, one in 260 million. And we all know how extraordinary it would be if we were the one who was that one in 260 million. Now, if you multiply those already incredible odds by about 40, then you move from 260 million up to about a trillion. And I don't even know how to figure out the ratio to a trillion trillion. It may be, but I'm not at all certain about the math, that the miracle of life is a 40 trillion times more exceptional event than the odds of any one of us winning the mega millions. You know how exceptional it would be to win the lottery, but it's 40 trillion times harder for life to appear. And that's just life, not intelligent life. It's bacteria, it's not human beings. And scientists, they look at this and they are utterly amazed. But some Christian churches, as a matter of fact, most Christian churches, they look at this and they somehow come up with a theology of original sin, that every man, woman, and child is born a sinner and born into a sinful world. If you've ever held a child, and to call that child a sinner simply because it is a human being, I think is an offense to God. The child is a gift from God, this world is a gift from God, and we have a lot of nerve telling God that this is all sinful and that that child is sinful. This past Monday evening, I attended a talk of, uh, from a Smith College geology professor about the geological story of our Connecticut River Valley. And I thought one of the things that was pretty cool was uh, Mount Sugarloaf would have been sticking up out of Lake Hitchcock. Uh, that's like a little island over there. And we would be under about, I don't know, maybe 100 feet of water sitting here 14,000 years ago. And it was held in a room at the Amherst Brewing Company, <laughs> as I've mentioned before. And the room was literally filled beyond capacity. They brought in extra chairs. People stood against the walls. Some even sat, there was like a little area in front of where the professor was talking. Some people actually sat there on the floor listening to the professor talk. I said to a friend of mine who was just like coming to church on Sunday morning at Holy Name, <laughs> the professor and the people there, they were excited, they were captivated, they were thrilled by the miraculous story of this living planet of ours, but too many people of faith, we remain unmoved by this miracle of creation because we have pictures in our head of Eden and of paradise and perfection, and we throw all of this away because of some imagined perfection. When Bishop Fodor was a young priest, even before the beginning of this church, back in the 1890s, he was teaching the formerly uneducated immigrant miners and their families in Scranton about the contemporary science of his day. He actually started a group to help teach these people who had no formal education so they would become more aware of the world around them. And then after this church was born, he instituted the Feast of Divine Love. This was the liturgical rejection of original sin, that we are by nature, inherently, the way God made us, we are by nature sinful and fallen. This was the liturgical affirmation that creation is a grand statement instead of divine love. The Bible story begins with God's act of creation. The first two days, according to the story, lay the groundwork of creation, and it's told rather matter-of-fact. It's not really a lot of embellishment. However, on the third day, life appeared, and now God says at the completion of the day, he says it was good. At the end of the sixth day of creation, again, according to the story, human beings are created, and God doesn't say it was good. He says it was very good. St. Paul writes to the very earliest Christian, ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power, God's divine nature, have been understood, they have been seen through the 
things that he has made. How strange it is to me that this awe before creation is now not found so much in the church as it is in science. And this is why the feast of divine love is so important. It writes this profound wrong. It gives us an example to say to all the world, stop letting the church, stop letting people of faith denigrate God's creation. Let us see it as an act of his love for us. And it's also important because it repairs a serious theological problem that is at the heart of Advent to Christmas. If Mary was the only person born free of original sinfulness so that Jesus then wouldn't inherit it through her, then Jesus' human nature is not the same as everyone else's. If his birth is different than mine, is different than yours, is different than everybody else, then Jesus is not as human as we are. And if we're all born one way, and Mary and Jesus are the exceptions, then we have to realize rationally that Jesus is not fully human. And if Jesus is not fully human, then the whole reason for God coming into the world is a null right from the very beginning. If he's shielded from our universal, inherited, right in our gene sinfulness, then his moral example is automatically, before he says once one parable, before he does one miracle, before he goes to the cross, is immediately compromised. But Jesus is born exactly as one of us. God has entered into our world in Jesus, and creation and life are even more sanctified because of that testimony that God has become us in this world. If God can be here, this is a holy place. It is quite obvious that creation is far from perfect, and we need to take a lot of the responsibility for that. But that is a far cry from saying that it is still not miraculous. And the greatest miracle in the whole of creation is that as the Bible says on the very first page, God created us in his own image. And that points to our intelligence and our free will. Remember, God doesn't have a body. It's not like God was once shorter and he's grown as we've grown taller. It's not like God is male or female. God is spirit. So when we're in the made image of God, it's intelligence and free will. And this creation is the God-given opportunity for us to work with God, to work like God, to make this creation even better. We're not being treated like, by God like perpetual infants. We're being treated by God like heirs. We can't react like that spoiled child yelling, I didn't ask to be born. The feast of divine love is the celebration of God's wondrous creation and his invitation to us to help make it even better. God is treating us as adults. So let us pray the words of Isaiah that we heard earlier in the Mass. Let his dwelling be glorious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I just got to share with you one little story before I go to the altar and say the prayers. Um, when I was at Monday night's uh, talk on the geology of our area, uh, there was one of the professors there was a Richard D. Little, and he is the professor, <coughs> professor of geology at Greenfield Community College. So I went over to talk to Richard D. Little because of our Bob Adamski. Uh, because Bob Adamski had, as over the years, traveled all over the country, and all over North America and Central America, and he would go and he would pick up rocks and minerals and stuff like that. And as now Robert is now a little bit more than 35, uh, he's, uh, he's given all of that uh, to Greenfield Community College. So I talked to Richard D. Little, and I said, do you know Bob Adamski? He said, oh, yes, I know Bob Adamski. And he was extremely grateful to Robert Adamski there for his donation of all of those minerals and rocks to the uh, Greenfield Community College and their geology department. So thank you very much on their behalf. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So if they ever have those talks again on science, uh, you should really think about going. They're extremely interesting. Bob, you are very impressed with your donation. So thank you very much. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty well, Lord, as we gather before your altar on the second Sunday of Advent, we offer our prayers for Helen Pohalski, who passed away on Friday. It's offered by Louise Pohalski and Janice. 
We offer our prayers for Fred Delisle, who passed away 50 years ago on December 10th, was offered by the Delisle family. We offer our prayers for the strength and comfort for Anne and Dan Cronin, uh, and also the continued strength and health of their baby, Elizabeth, who is growing stronger day by day, as offered by the Pekarski family. We offer our prayers in memory of Mother Florence Mietlitsky on the uh, anniversary of her birthday, which is December 4th, is offered by her daughter, Shirley Mietlitsky Floyd. We offer our prayers for Gary Hurley on the fourth anniversary of his death, which was December 3rd of 2009, is offered by the Moore family. We continue to offer our prayers for John Savage, who is battling cancer, is offered by Joe and Peg Pushton. We continue to offer our prayers for Marshall Garenstan, also battling cancer, as uh, from his friends here at the parish. We continue to offer prayers for my friends, Dr. Jay Sullivan and Susan Zarechak, as they also battle cancer. We offer prayers for the health and the strength of Hugh Hubbard, as offered by the Hubbard family. We offer prayers for uh, Francis Murray, a high school friend who passed away yesterday while in the Veterans Hospital in Florida, is offered by Ellen Strosky. We offer our prayers for Don Strosky's best friend, Jonathan Swan. Uh, this Wednesday, December 11th, will be the first year anniversary of his death, is offered by Don and Ellen Strosky and the entire Strosky and Palmer family. We also offer our prayers for my cousin, Judy O'Brien, uh, recently diagnosed with cancer and recently was begun her treatments to fight. Uh, that they may be successful. We ask the Lord to hear all the private prayers that we bring to your altar. We ask you to bless all of us here gathered, to be with those of our parish who are unable to be with us here today, and those of our parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for all these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and in the light. May they rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker and tender, of all the seeking and unseen. I believe in the Lord, Lord. Yeah. 
I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. After these and other words of the heart of prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took the bread into his holy and venerable hand, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty power, giving thanks to you, he blessed, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and eat of this, for this is my body. Taking also this excellent child into his holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to you, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and drink, for this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which for you and for many shall be shed for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me.
same serenity of spirit which you bestow in the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed apostles, martyrs, and all of those who resolutely march under the banner of our Savior, that being supported by your help, may always be free from sin and secure from all despair. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Throughout all ages of ages, shall I return unto the Lord for all the graces that he has rendered unto me. I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. High praise will I call upon the Lord, which be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve my soul unto life everlasting.